kidnap and murder spree that plunges Taiwan into chaos. In the Philippines, a hostage situation spirals out of control. And in Hong Kong, a double kidnapping with enough twists for Hollywood. If this was a script for a movie, no one would believe it. In this series, we look back at some of Asia's most heinous and shocking crimes and examine why they became so embedded in our history and why they affected us so much on a personal level. They had information, they, they trained, they'd rehearsed, uh, they had a plan, and they were ruthless. I'm Agri Bunyai, a journalist from Thailand. Join me as I chronicle the sensational moments of the crimes that shocked Asia. According to a recent global report, kidnappings in Asia were at their highest in 2016. While internationally, kidnappings have been a frequent method of terrorists and criminals looking to make a political point or just for the ransom. Kidnappings for money have always been about a fast and easy payoff, and chances are that if the ransom is paid, then the hostage will be released. But not all kidnappings are motivated by money. But the one thing that they do have in common is that they rely on careful and skilled negotiations. In this episode, we look at some of Asia's most infamous kidnappings and see how when negotiations break down, things can turn ugly very quickly. Kidnappers of Taiwan TV star Bai Bingbing's daughter have been on the run for seven months after they abduct 17-year-old Bai Xiaoyan, who was on her way to school. Chu 因為你一輩子不會去想到有人這麼狠去把人家的手指剁下來。那個痛。This was 1997 and Bai Bingbing was at the peak of her career. She was actually recording when she received that call. And despite being warned not to contact the police, she did just that. What mother wouldn't. But that decision set off a sequence of dramatic events worthy of the plot of a movie, and her personal tragedy became very much a public one. He had a famous movie star with a kidnapped daughter and an island-wide manhunt. It was the perfect fodder for a tabloid-hungry press in Taiwan. In the second day, many and they stayed true to those words, giving her and the police the runaround, changing the drop-off location for the five million US dollar ransom demand at the last minute. Bai Bingbing receives one last call from the kidnappers with a new meeting point. Just when she thought she could finally have her daughter back safe, the media foiled the entire exchange, appearing at the location. Enraged, the kidnappers abort their plans and never call again. Taiwan's press has a reputation for being one of the most aggressive in Asia, but here they've violated a widely known practice, and that's that you don't report on a kidnapping until there's been a resolution. On the other hand, why did the kidnappers pick the daughter of a celebrity if they had wanted to stay under the radar? 
Despite the ransom exchange failure, police successfully traced the call and identified three suspects, convicted criminals Lin Chin Seng, Gao Tianming, and Chen Jin Sing. But that provided no comfort for Bai Bingbing when she receives news that a female corpse is found 12 kilometers from where her daughter was abducted. Forensics confirm the body to be that of Bai Xiaoyan and estimate that she could have been dead for 8 to 10 days. This means that she was probably killed two or three days into the abduction and possibly before the media had even gotten hold of it. The kidnappers had played by Bing Bing for a fool. It was a heartbreaking end for a mother who had borne witness to every step of the tragedy. And the horror of Bai Xiaoyan's murder was only the start of a bloody crime rampage as her killers go on a seven-month kidnap and killing spree. Taiwan launched the largest manhunt in its history, and as posters of the three suspects began to pop up, mass hysteria set in. Parents began to pick up their kids from school instead of letting them walk home alone, and in classes, young girls were taught how to use pepper spray. Bai Xiaoyan's death triggered a real fear that social order in the country was collapsing, and then it sparked the biggest protests against rising crime rates that Taiwan has ever seen. And it even broke down the government of the first democratically elected president, with several key ministers, and the chief of police resigning amidst protests. Less than four months after Bai Xiaoyan's murder, a public tip-off sends police rushing to Wuchang Street to apprehend suspects Lin Chunseng and Gao Tianming. One police officer is killed and another is injured. Lin Chun Seng is shot six times before he turns the gun on himself. With the police still ordering massive reinforcements. And true to form, the media packed the streets broadcasting the 800-man siege live across the nation. Chaos resulted in the police losing control of the situation, and Chen and Gao escape. Once again, the media had gotten in the way of police operations. But surprisingly, even though Chen and Gao knew that the police were hot on their heels, this didn't put an end to their crime rampage. Who knows what they were trying to achieve at this point? Well, what they did next would go beyond what anyone thought possible. Two months after the shootout, police received chilling reports that three bodies had been found in a plastic surgery clinic in downtown Taipei. 发现一个女士可能大概是中年人躺在那边头顶上的弹口 and Chen had forced a plastic surgeon, his wife and their assistant at gunpoint to alter their appearances. After the procedures, they execute all three. Plastic surgery at gunpoint. This is like the surreal plot of a Hollywood movie, except that this is very real and it's one of the most horrific acts of crime that Taiwan has ever witnessed. 
what goes through the mind of someone who's so desperate that they'll get plastic surgery but still finds time to rape and murder while they're on the run. In a stroke of luck, someone from the public spots Gao entering a massage parlor in Xipai, Taipei City. A gun battle erupts, and a police officer is hit, after which Gao Tianming kills himself. A celebrity's daughters kidnap and murder, a shootout on the streets with police, and an execution at a plastic surgery clinic. Just some of the scenes from one of the largest ever crime sprees in Taiwan. There were cries of police inefficiency and media meddling, and this caused furor on the streets. Two of the key suspects had killed themselves, and the mastermind, Chen Jinxing, was still on the run. When he got news of his accomplice's deaths, this sent him into desperation. And at this point, he shoots into international headlines. He kidnaps a South African military attaché and his family. But at this point, what was he truly trying to achieve besides infamy? Did he honestly think that he could negotiate a getaway deal in exchange for the hostages? For the third time, Taiwan's media circus jeopardizes police operations. This time, broadcasting their phone interviews with Chen live. Things were starting to get surreal. At one point, a journalist even asked Chen to sing karaoke with him over the radio. You have to remember, this was being broadcast live. The listeners at home couldn't believe there is. He had reporters with no negotiation experience engaged in hours of dialogue with a mentally and emotionally unstable killer that was holding four people hostage. Because they had him on the phone for most of the night, they effectively cut off the only line of communication that the police had to contact him on. Was there any wonder there was such a public outcry over such incredulity? But Chen spots the SWAT team coming for him and starts shooting. Hostages, Colonel McGill Alexander and his 22-year-old daughter, Melanie, are caught in the crossfire, taking bullets to the knee, wrist and back. What happens next can only come from years of experience in hostage negotiations. Commander Ho risks everything and enters the apartment unarmed, skillfully convincing Chen to release the hostages who need medical help. After a 21 hour standoff, Chen Jinxing finally surrenders, and the seven month terror that reigned over Taiwan comes to an end. On January 22, 1998, Chen was found guilty of three kidnappings, ten rapes, and four murders. He was executed by firing squad on October 6, 1999. From the murder of Bai Xiaoyan to the abduction of a diplomat, the media were operating at fever pitch 24-7. And while ultimately the Taiwanese public did blame the government and the police for not stopping these criminals earlier in their crime wave, they were also angry at the press. And because life can be dull, the media feels the need to sensationalize their stories, especially crime stories. Later, some editors were forced to resign, and despite media guidelines and fines that were enforced in the months that followed the murder, it's business as usual back in Taiwan. As for Bai Bingbing, her ordeal turned her into a tough-on-crime social activist. In some parts of the Philippines, such as Mindanao, hostage-taking isn't that uncommon. It's so common, in fact, that the special forces even have explicit training to handle all kinds of hostile situations. But this just makes one particular incident that occurred in Manila in 2010 all the more tragic. Despite the training, the tools and the experience, almost everything about that day ended in complete disaster. August 23, 2010, a massacre in the heart of the Philippines leaves eight dead and diplomatic ties strained. 
A disgruntled former police officer hijacks a tour bus on its way to Rizal Park. He takes 25 hostages. 20 were tourists from Hong Kong. 55-year-old Rolando Mendoza has only one agenda, to clear his name over a crime he didn't commit. He insists his grievance is only with the local government. As long as his name is cleared and he gets his job back, the hostages will be safe. Quick thinking tour group leader Diana Chan notifies her office of the hijacking in secret. Local authorities are quickly mobilized. Mendoza's former colleague is sent to the Quirino grandstand in downtown Manila to make first contact. I asked if I can go near the bus so we can talk personally. And he said, yes, come here. I'm, I'm longing to talk to anybody. I want this incident to be uh, finished immediately. Investigators would later point to the moment that Salvador approached Mendoza as the first in a long line of mistakes. He had been right there and the gun had been hanging by his side. If Salvador had disabled him then, none of this would have happened. Instead, he chose to write down Mendoza's demands so that he could show his superiors instead. He only wanted that he be reinstated, his image be brought back to him, the pride, the Manila's finest uh, morale. That's what all he wanted. Mendoza was a decorated officer, and even after the incident, his colleagues described him as hardworking and kind. It's worth thinking whether there's something to this. After all, this was a man who felt like he was left with no other choice but to resort to desperate measures in order to prove his innocence. By this time, the tour bus perimeter is surrounded by hordes of media, exactly what Mendoza had wanted for an audience. When I saw that this guy is a police officer, I said, like, he knows the deal. Probably he will give up. It's like no one was taking him seriously, actually. To show he meant no harm to the hostages, he releases a mother and her three children and an elderly couple. But as midday strikes, tensions mount as police keep Mendoza waiting. At this point, while the released hostages are receiving medical attention, the police completely miss the opportunity to ask them about the situation inside of the bus. It doesn't occur to them that the information that they got could have been used to plan for the extraction of the remaining hostages. Then, unexpectedly, Rolando Mendoza's brother, Gregorio, shows up at the scene to ask his brother to end the hijacking. And for reasons unknown, he too is armed. I tap on his left shoulder and grab his right arm, snatch it from him. I told him, you can it uh, You're not allowed here. He was already highly strung, and now Mendoza had to witness how police manhandled his brother and relieved him of his personal weapon. He was becoming agitated. It was seven hours into the hijacking, and they still hadn't come to him with a solution. Furthermore, the chief executive of Hong Kong, Donald Tsang, had been unable to contact President Aquino. This would do nothing for diplomatic ties between the two countries in the weeks that followed. Hope for the hostages emerges at nightfall when negotiators present Mendoza with a letter from the authorities. Mendoza, who is now on the phone with a radio news network, is livid. <laughs> It only offers an extension to review Mendoza's case instead of his demand for full reinstatement. Negotiations were going south, but at this point, nothing was being done to calm Mendoza down. Word of the hijacking is spread across the Philippines, and the public were asking, why hadn't they just given in to his demands? They wouldn't have had to honor them after all. They've been extracted under force. 
Mendoza would have released the hostages, the police could have arrested him, and that would have been the end of it. I told him, please come down. What if I can uh, convince my boss to, to uh, issue an order, not actually reinstating you, but uh, suspending the implementation? And he answered back, told me that, uh, okay. This buys only limited time with Mendoza. Colonel Yebra's superiors, however, aren't agreeable on issuing the orders. When the group did not reach an agreement as to whether or not issue said order, Mayor Lim suggested that they all go to Emerald Restaurant to take their dinner. It was, to put it mildly, a bewildering decision for the entire negotiation team to leave a hostage situation and go for dinner. The public was shocked, there was outcry, there were lives at stake here. Not only that, but it left a decision-making vacuum at the command post, and the failure to implement the new command immediately would have devastating consequences. Another drama with Rolando Mendoza's brother unfolds. He is resisting arrest for breaching the police cordon. Mendoza sees this happening from a live broadcast in the bus and flies into rage. Mendoza's patience breaks and he opens fire. I look at the door of the bus. I saw the first guy that was handcuffed earlier. He just fell. I told you, Ivor, you can't kill him. It's impossible. It's a new world. How have you lost your mind? Come with me! Come to King Alfred! We shall never surrender! The golden age of the Vikings is over. Putting on the Olympic Games motivated the Japanese. Everybody was really excited about re-entering the global scene. Japan has bounced back and bounced back even stronger. Former police officer Rolando Mendoza has taken 25 tourists hostage in Manila. After hours of failed negotiations, he has opened fire inside the bus. Amid the chaos, bus driver Alberto Lubang manages to break free from his handcuffs and escapes. When the driver escaped from the window, and shouted, Pinatayin lahat, Pinatayin lahat. All of them was killed, all of them was killed. But then we thought that Captain Mendoza already shot all the hostages. It was clear that no one was experienced enough to handle this hijacking. Nobody had thought to ask the driver what was happening on the bus. And to compound matters, both the SWAT team and the Special Action Force were waiting to take Mendoza out, but there was no communication between the two. Things were spiraling out of control. We were just waiting for orders if we will go in or not. Kasi wala na international na yun eh. Pero mo mga foreigner yan. Dapat naman talaga sila. Pero dahil di kami binigyan ng order, kami ang pawpil. 
Eventually, orders from the ground commander, General Magdebe, to send in the SWAT team would overrule the original SAF directive. This decision would come back to haunt him. At 7.30 p.m., the Manila police SWAT team moves in. Nandun ako sa harap sa may travel set. Kaabang ako, nakaganyan ako. Nakaganyan ako. Abang ako, baka pumunta sa area ko, akin. Pag nakuha ko siya, makita ko siya, akin siya. Heavy rain hampers the SWAT's efforts to get a clear visual inside the bus. After so many tries, about 5-10 minutes, go of 5-10 minutes, the media is us. We're like about 50 meters away. Hey, come on, guys, just uh, grab. You see that door handle there on the right side of the bus towards the end? That's the exit uh, door. Flip it open or twist it and then pull the door. That's the exit. That's how you get in. And that's what they did. But as the SWAT team enter via the emergency exit, they are met with gunfire. <laughs> After over an hour of attempting to board the bus, they pause and regroup. It was a disastrous display of tactics, and it was clear that General Magdebe had made the wrong decision. Immediately after that, he was made to give up command of the operation. But the big question was, how had Mendoza been able to anticipate their every move? Thanks to the live media coverage, the hijacker had a bird's eye view of everything happening outside the bus. Si Kawawa naman kami nagtatrabaho, pero susugod namin sa sarili namin ito. Pinapanood kami ni Medusa kung paano kami babarilin. Okay namang coverage, huwag lang ipakita. Huwag lang ipakita, pero sa Juan, pwede naman siguro, ewan ko kung paano ma-block yung parasya sa kanyang TV niya. But the problem was bigger than that. The SWAT team weren't even trained for an assault like this. They didn't even have the right equipment. Explosives to break through the windows and ladders to climb into the bus. They hadn't even set up a basic safety perimeter. Nobody should have been within 350 meters of that bus. But journalists were sitting just 50 meters away. And as a result, a news crew member and a 10-year-old boy were injured during the shootout. The SWAT were evidently out of their depth, so the special action force was sent in to clean up the mess. So what my thing that time was just uh, throw uh, tear gas. Mendoza goes down. He's forced to move to the front of the bus. Three minutes later, it all comes to an end. A SWAT sniper in the grandstand takes a shot. We see uh, Mendoza's body half outside the bus, half was inside. I mean, uh, half of his head was gone. After 11 hours, the siege is finally over. Emergency services rush to the bus and complete mayhem ensues. Later investigations revealed that the efforts of the emergency services were severely hampered by the lack of a post-assault plan, which is odd because they had literally a whole day to prepare. And the lack of coordination meant that some of the victims were turned away from nearby hospitals, and because of this, eight out of the 25 hostages died. Both the public and the press agreed this operation had been a complete failure. Post-crisis, it was revealed that Mendoza had actually gotten what he demanded, full reinstatement to the police service. We are trying hard to reach out for him to give the good news that his request, his demand, was already given and accepted and approved by the PNP authorities. But that order did not come to his hands. That letter was delayed in traffic, arriving only minutes before the SWAT's first assault. Across the Philippines and around the world, the operation was deemed a failure of epic proportions. Later, criminal charges were brought up against Manila's mayor, General Magdebe, the hostage negotiator, Colonel Yebra, 
two journalists, including Erwin Tulfo, and three broadcast networks. The disaster even broke down diplomatic ties between Hong Kong and the Philippines. Up until 2014, Hong Kong maintained a black alert level that's on par with Syria against travel to the Philippines. Bombing again and again. Tokyo was burned out. Literally destroyed the eastern half of the city. The earthquake hit. Very big shock to Japanese society. Putting on the Olympic Games motivated the Japanese. Everybody was really excited about re-entering the global scene. Japan has bounced back and bounced back even stronger. We tend to think that everything in the world is pretty much known. But it isn't true. Are there such things as deadly forests? A hundred bodies a year are found in that place. Bizarre creatures. There has been thousands of sightings of chupacabras. Haunted houses. Do you think what's in that house is evil? The answers are frightening. challenge was like a bomb going on. They're all mobilized to support the war effort. Hitler became dependent. This is just the start of what could be a long pattern of destruction. Humans didn't do this. So, how much you want for it? Is this really LeBron James' mouthpiece? That is really, really cool. I think it's priceless. <laughs> this is Vegas. I might hit a jackpot. Oh, it's going to be fun. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, brother. I would have killed for this thing when I was 16 years old. It's an all-familiar plot line. Someone with money is abducted and a big ransom demand is made. Once the money's paid, the hostage is released. But in April 1990, Hong Kong becomes home to a first of its kind, a double kidnapping. Billionaire tycoon Teddy Wang is attacked and abducted from his car. But intriguingly, he's reliving his own nightmare from seven years ago, from the first time that he was abducted. How unlucky do you have to be to be abducted twice? Or was there something else at play here? Teddy and Nina were very low-profile, wealthy people in those days, and, and not a great deal was known about them. Despite that, Teddy Wang and his wife aren't strangers to Hong Kong's community. They both run a successful property business, China Chem. If anything, the couple were known for how frugal they were, spending as little as possible from the millions that they earned. When they went out to eat, it said that they would ask to borrow Tupperware containers so that they could take home uneaten food, and then they wouldn't return the Tupperware containers. But their eccentricities did very little to block the targets on their backs. On April 12th, 1983, Teddy is driving to work with Nina. They run into what looks like a roadblock. Moments later, they're surrounded and forced out of the car at gunpoint. The kidnappers force Nina into the back seat of her car, while Teddy is blindfolded, tied up, and pushed into a modified refrigerator in the back of a van. The gang had obviously spent some time thinking about this kidnapping and planning it. This wasn't some haphazard weekend idea, oh, let's go and kidnap Teddy Wang. They had it worked out. The kidnappers had only targeted Teddy. Nina, now back at home with the police, receives a call from the kidnappers. They instruct her to pick up a package from the women's public toilet in a building in Hong Kong's central business district. Inside, she finds a Polaroid picture of Teddy tied to a bed, a cassette tape, and strangely, the keys to their Mercedes. But why give back the car keys? That seemed like an overly friendly gesture, as if perhaps the kidnappers had known Teddy and Nina personally. The tape carries the kidnappers' demands. 11 million US dollars in exchange for Teddy alive. The, the money asked for him was at that time the largest amount 
ever, ever asked for in a ransom demand for a kidnapped victim. She tried to negotiate, perhaps could lower the ransom. You know, it's an incredibly large amount of money. That she wouldn't be able to get hold of it. And over, you know, a couple of phone calls, she was told, we know how much you can get. We know you can get a billion dollars if necessary. It seems odd that she would pick that moment to negotiate the ransom, especially as it said that she and Teddy would have done anything for each other. Well, you know, we obviously advised her not to, not to pay the money. She turned around and said, well, I want, you know, my husband back. Remembering they'd been basically childhood sweethearts. Their whole life was each other. Some countries have official bans on paying out ransoms, especially when it comes to dealing with terrorists. Part of the fear is that by paying up the ransom, they'll perpetuate the problem. But for the victims' families, it's a lot more complicated. Why would they risk the life of a loved one? Nina transfers the ransom, and nine days later, Teddy is released. And he provides police with a crucial clue to the kidnappers' identities. When he was in the, in the refrigerator, the blind around his eyes uh, wasn't that tight, and he was able to see there was a slight gap. And he's looking towards the back of the van, but he noticed this sticker in the back window that said, Jesus loves you. The information proves useful, and the police find a vehicle near to where Teddy was released. The registration leads them straight to one of the kidnappers, which in turn leads them to four other co-conspirators in Taiwan and Hong Kong. They're all charged with Teddy's kidnapping. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's reported that once he was released, Teddy told his wife Nina off for paying too much money. But in a way, he was right. He had set a precedent. It means that every other kidnapped gang will now seek to maybe not better that but use that as a benchmark figure when they go out to kidnap someone by the 1990s hong kong was quickly becoming a kidnapping hub it was home to some high profile kidnappings including business tycoon lee kashing's son it's reported that he paid one billion hong kong dollars for his son's release now you would think after everything that happened with the first kidnapping that teddy and nina would do everything they could to prevent this from happening again after the first kidnapping, he hired a lot of bodyguards. And for a certain time, he feel that he's safe. So he want to uh, try by himself and uh, dismiss all these uh, bodyguards. It was exactly seven years after his first kidnapping that Teddy's decision to fire his bodyguards would prove disastrous. This time, the kidnappers seemed a lot more aggressive. The calls that came in were very direct, very clear. You know, we're going to kill him, we're going to cut his ears off, um, we want your money. That was clear and very apparent. His kidnappers demand a staggering 60 million US dollars, the highest ransom in Hong Kong's history at the time. Uh, Nina began to um, worry. She became uh, very distressed. And at one point, she said, I'm going to pay. My advice was clear, no proof of life, don't pay. Uh, hers was, it's my money, I'll do what I like with it. Why wouldn't she pay the ransom? It had worked the first time. But that wasn't the end of the story. Later, the South China Morning Post reported that Nina had engaged in some bizarre rituals to help track down her husband. She ordered contractors to dig as many as 80 feng shui holes across China Chem owned properties. This is what feng shui masters call planting a life base. In the end, Nina and the police made a compromise. Only half of the money would be wired in order to give the police enough time to track down his abductors. Back in the 90s, electronic banking was still in its infancy and ATMs were scarce. And this is what gave the police the advantage. We split it into two-man teams on every ATM machine that we could find. And we linked up between that and the, the bank so that as soon as anybody attempted to access electronically one of those, they would call us, we would call them through our control room, and then we would go out to the guys in the field. All this before mobile me massive use of mobile phone. Soon enough, the bank account is being accessed. The police narrow in on the suspect. Interrogations reveal that he is part of a criminal network spread across Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. The ringleader is a former Taiwanese intelligence agent named Chen Shi Yen. In parallel, uh, we, had a, we had a coordinated movement, a team on the ground in uh, Taiwan, 
moved and hit a hotel room in, in Taipei and we caught Ch Chen and a number of other individuals packing the proceeds of the money into shoeboxes. Police recover 28.5 million US dollars, but Teddy is still missing and investigators now fear the worst. On the evening of April 12th, Teddy is taken to an apartment and drugged. His unconscious body is then wrapped in tarpaulin. It seemed that the kidnappers had no intention of releasing Teddy, or even keeping him alive for that matter. They then take Teddy's body out on a boat in the South China Sea, but when they see the Chinese Navy approaching, they throw his body overboard in panic. Teddy's body has never been recovered. It's not just what the suspects say, it's what you see when you arrest them, what they're in possession of, how they behave, that helps fit in to the patterns. But bit by bit, it became very apparent uh, that, that, that Teddy Wang was no more. So, who could have wanted Teddy dead? By some accounts, his tight-fistedness had made him a lot of enemies, but was that really enough motivation to kidnap him not once, but twice? Some even joked that it would have been easier to figure out who didn't want him dead. Some of the more skeptical public questioned whether Teddy could have been involved himself. I told you I really can't kill him. It's impossible. It's a new world. How have you lost your mind? Come with me! Come to King Alfred! We shall never surrender! The golden age of the Vikings is over. Teach you how to make an impression. I'll make sure everyone knows about you. I got something I need to do. He's crazy. There will be blood on his hands. You think I'm being paranoid? All my life I wanted to be somebody, someone. Show me what you're doing. That's when you create something great. Welcome to your new life. You should watch it and allow yourself to be inspired. If you don't approach the ranch with a degree of reverence, bad things happen. We've verified and documented some of the most disturbing, unexplained events on this property. It's just a place, right? My hope is to get some answers. When we bring new people onto the ranch, the ranch behaves differently than it normally does. There it is again. This is the most unique science project of its kind. There's things that go on on that ranch that I cannot get my head around. Nothing's junk. Big building, big stuff. Big man stuff. Make me proud. I've got to try to buy this. Can we look around? Absolutely. 20 years of my negotiating skills to try to get the job done. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. It's just the kind of place me and Frankie like. That's what I'm talking about, that signature piece. This is going to be an awesome pick. 130. 125. 130. 130. <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong billionaire Teddy Wang is kidnapped a second time, and his kidnappers confess to dumping him out at sea. But his body is never recovered, and his wife Nina refuses to believe that Teddy is dead. Nina was fixated that he was alive and waiting on some beach for her, or at least she said she was. And we had all sorts of strange individuals being called for their advice as to um, his coordinates. Um, it really was quite extraordinary. Nina was so convinced that she hired Feng Shui masters and private investigators to help find her husband. She even claimed that she received phone calls from Teddy up until the year 2000. So did Teddy fake his own death? It wouldn't be the first time that someone from the wealthy elite had done something like that. As for Nina, her own personal tragedy transformed her in very peculiar ways. This was a, a, a woman of a certain age who wandered around in pigtails, which made her stand out from a crowd, if nothing else did, wearing very short skirts, again, for a woman of her age, slightly unusual. And, you know, I mean, people at first really didn't take her seriously. But Nina's business acumen never wavered. She takes charge of China Chem, growing its fortunes. Little Sweetie, Nina's new nickname from the media, is shaking up Hong Kong's traditionally sober, male-dominated business community. In 2006, Forbes names her Asia's richest woman. But behind the scenes, a battle is brewing. Seven years after Teddy's disappearance, his 88-year-old father, Wang Dinshim, goes to Hong Kong's high court 
to have his son formally declared dead. Nina had been resisting this move, but English common law generally assumes that once a person's been missing for seven years, they can be legally declared dead. So did Nina resist because she genuinely believed that her husband was still alive? Or was it because she knew that his father was in possession of a will that made him the sole beneficiary of his son's estate? And so begins a lengthy legal suit, a classic case of he said, she said. In 2001, Wang Dinxin tells the court that Nina was written out of her son's will in 1968 because she had been caught having an affair. Nina produces a counter will. She claims it was written in 1990, weeks before Teddy was kidnapped the second time. In it, he leaves his entire estate to her and includes a handwritten declaration saying, one life, one love, in English. In 2002, Teddy's father wins the case Nina's will is declared a forgery, and she is indicted. Then, in 2005, Hong Kong's Court of Appeals overturns the judgment, and all charges against Nina are dropped. She officially inherits the China Chem Empire, now estimated to be worth 4 billion US dollars. Less than 18 months after her legal vindication, 68-year-old Nina, who has been fighting ovarian cancer, passes away. But Nina's legal battles didn't leave with her. After her death, three conflicting wills emerge. The plaintiffs are Nina's family, China Kemp's charitable foundation, and a feng shui master named Tony Chan, who claims to be Nina's lover. From the first time that Teddy Wang was abducted in 1983, up until the day that Nina Wang died in 2007, the media not only in Hong Kong, but across the world, followed this story with as much intensity as it does celebrity gossip. And why wouldn't they? This was a case like no other, filled with eccentric characters, obscene ransoms, sexual affairs, and good old wealthy family politics. Feng Shui master Tony Chan's will was declared a forgery in 2013. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. This case brought to light the ugliness of inheritance issues between wealthy family members. But ultimately, a judge upheld the will bestowing Nina's fortune to China Chem's charitable organizations. I don't think this is the end of the saga yet. There's always seems to be another, another little element to this that, that pops up and catches everybody by surprise. In the next episode, we look at cases where criminals go on the run, setting off some of the biggest manhunts the police have embarked on. Two large heists worthy of a blockbuster film, one in Hong Kong and another in Malaysia. And in Taiwan, one impulsive act of trying to save one's face leads to a no-holds-barred crime wave.